get right to it. Uh, so the Dayton family name has been synonymous with leadership, philanthropy, entrepreneurial spirit, and the cold north for over 100 years. Uh, this morning, Eric Dayton is kind enough to come and share his story with us. Uh, you may have dined at his restaurant, the Marble Bar, or uh, sorry, the Bachelor Farmer. I uh, already screwed that up. Uh, or had a drink at uh, Marble Bar, or, uh, procured some fine goods at, uh, and I know I'll screw this one up. Ask Cove Finlayson. Hey, hey, I got it. Uh, Uh, but in addition to promoting and offering some of these amazing uh, uh, services and experiences in North Loop, Eric is an avid outdoorsman um, and a champion of climate change awareness. Uh, Eric has traveled north of the Arctic Circle uh, with famed Arctic explorer and Minnesota native, Will Steger, and is carrying the torch uh, to the next generation. Um, he has experienced some of these things firsthand, so uh, fantastic experiences there. Uh, Eric has most recently received global recognition from the World Economic Forum for his ability to lead and promote change in this space. Um, so, again, fantastic opportunity that we're able to be here and listen to him speak. Uh, as a champion of promoting climate change awareness and rebranding the cold flyover Midwest as the proud North, uh, I believe Eric's message is simple yet powerful. Uh, be proud of where we come from, delight others with what we have to offer, and leave things better than how we found them. Please welcome me in uh, uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you for that introduction, Neil. Thank you all for being here today and for having me to, uh, to join you this morning. Okay. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about what I do, but, but more importantly today, I want to talk about why I do it. And I've been asked to, to talk a little bit about leadership, and so I want to focus on the idea of mission-driven <coughs> leadership and why I believe it's important and why it's, uh, why it's important for our company. Uh, but first I'll just provide a little, bit of, a little bit of background and a little bit of context. So here we are in Minneapolis. Uh, this is where I was born and raised. I'm a fifth generation Minnesotan. And I grew up here playing hockey, going camping up in the Boundary Waters, visiting our world-class museums. I thought this was a pretty great place to spend my childhood. And through that experience, I developed a deep sense of pride in, in being from here. And being a Minnesotan became a really important part of my identity. Um, and then I had the experience for the first time when I left uh, Minneapolis to go away to college on the East Coast. For the first time, I, I was surrounded by people who weren't from where I was from. And I, I, for the first time, became aware of the perception of people in other parts of the country of my home state. And I realized they were very different from what I knew to be true growing up here. So basically, when I told my college classmates that I was from Minnesota, this is what they pictured. <laughs> And maybe that's a little on the nose after the winter that we just had, but, uh, but you know, it was this idea of sort of Arctic tundra, wasteland, permafrost, and, and what was worse than that is that they kind of put us into this catch-all category, this sort of nebulous blob of the sort of the Midwest, upper Midwest, this part of the country that they didn't really know much about, and, and even more so, they didn't really think there was much to know. Uh, and I, I really took that personally, and, and as we know when we get put into this, this sort of nebulous blog category, it becomes, it becomes easy to write off, and that's what they, that's what they did. You know, we were flyover country to them. And so that really had an impact on me, and I think still to this day influences what, what I do and what our company does, and what I realized was that we weren't doing a very good job of telling our story. Um, so fast forward to 2011, my brother and I opened a restaurant in the North Loop neighborhood of Minneapolis called The Bachelor Farmer. We've got a cocktail bar in the basement uh, below the restaurant called The Bachelor, called Marble Bar. See, even I can't get it right. <laughs> uh, Thank you. And, uh, and we opened a small men's clothing shop called Asco Finlayson. And all of, our business, all of our businesses were rooted in a sense of pride and a sense of place. And the idea was that we were trying to tell the story of this place through the different things that we were doing, whether that was food, hospitality, the products that we were making and selling. Um, as we thought about this story that we were telling, we wondered, you know, what if, was there a better way for us to tell our story? And what if we claimed our own identity to help us better control the narrative? And, you know, we kind of started to think about this. My brother and I were like, well, there's the East and the South and the West, and is there something that's missing, and could that be an opportunity? And so we had, we had this idea, but we didn't know if it was a good one or not, so we decided to do a little experiment. And so we did the obvious thing, we made hats. 
Uh, and so in 2013, we made 150 hats that simply said the word north. Uh, they were made and are made to this day uh, in Cloquet, Minnesota. And we put them out in our, in our shop and asked our them to see what, what people would think, what the response would be. And I still remember that, that first day of people walking into the store and seeing these hats. And before we had a chance to sort of explain what we were doing or what our idea was or try to convince them of why they should agree with us, they just they saw the hats, they said, yep, I got it. I'm never calling us the Midwest again. I'll take six hats. And it just, it just clicked for people. It just resonated. And the, the 150 hats, which we thought were going to last us through the holidays, sold out in a matter of days. And we realized that we, we had tapped into something. We were onto something. And then that proved to be true. And so what started with some local press interest in this idea, then turned into national interest. And this Wall Street Journal story really, really started to amplify the message uh, nationally and beyond. And then in addition to kind of the, the buzz of press and attention, what was even more exciting to us was that the idea started to take root and started to be adopted and, and employed by others. And so here's our uh, Minnesota United MLS Soccer Club. Their you know, rallying cry now is the North is Rising. Uh, more recently, the Timberwolves. Uh, use now All Eyes North as their marketing uh, message. And so it was exciting to see that other, other people, other organizations were starting to see the value in this idea and that it wasn't just us. And then even more recently, Explore Minnesota, which is the state's tourism agency, uh, has started to talk about come find your true north here. And so the north is becoming not just the story that we tell ourselves about this place, where we're from and where we live, but it becomes how we tell our story to others, to the rest of the country and to the rest of the world. And so as, as the momentum was building, we sensed an opportunity. We saw that, that this was had the potential to become a big idea. Um, but we, we started to ask ourselves, what are we really trying to accomplish here? What are we, what are we trying to do with this? And uh, uh, something that was really influential for me in, in thinking about this was an author and a, a speaker named Simon Sinek, and you can find his talk online if you haven't seen it before. It's a, a widely viewed TED talk, and it's about the power of why. And any organization, whether it's our company or this institution, asking itself, why why do we exist? Why 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 do we do what we do? Um, and he argues that every organization needs to have a clear answer to that question. And so that led to a process of, of conversation on our team. That, that resulted in what we call our four pole stars. And so this is not this is not a document that we use for marketing. This isn't sort of a customer-facing message, but it's more of an internal reference. These, this is really our sort of four guiding lights of why we do what we do. And I thought I'd share them here today uh, with all of you. Um, and so as you can see, we've got you know, Explore the North. Uh, we've got a, a company of people who sort of love to be continuously challenged, continue you know always be learning, and we feel like not just the geography of the North, but the history, the cultures, the people. There's a lot to learn, a lot to explore. Plenty there to keep us busy for a long time, uh, learning, learning and exploring more and more. Uh, then we want to take what we learn and we want to share it. We want to amplify it and tell the story. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. And then protect the North is, has become a hugely important part of, of why we do what we do. And I'm, I'm going to focus on that, so I'll come back to that later. And then lastly, lead the North. We want to be leaders in this, in this idea, this movement, and make sure that we're, to the extent that we can, helping to steer it to be a movement for good. And I'll just add one other thing about, about the Pole Stars and why this has been really valuable for us. Because we're a company that has kind of a diverse set of operations, you know, where we have a restaurant, we have a cocktail bar, where we have real estate, uh, apparel, it helps to unify all these different things that we're doing and all the different people working in the organization, whether you're you know, a line cook or a server or a bartender or a designer or a digital marketer. Everyone kind of knows what we're trying to accomplish together and it helps everyone keep pulling in the same direction, which is especially important when you have a bit of, you know, sort of a diverse range of, of operations. So I want to now kind of illustrate a couple of these and, and show what they look like in action. So I'll start with, with the, the idea of to share the North. And, and I'm using here as an example actually something that's not part of our company, not, not part of our business. It's a nonprofit organization that I helped to start a few years ago called The Great Northern. Um, I'm the board chair, so I'm helping to lead it, but it's, it's separate, it's a 501c3 separate from uh, our business. And the idea behind The Great Northern was is this idea of North was, was gaining momentum. How could we create the North as an experience that we could then invite people into and invite them to be part of? 
And so what, what resulted from that desire was a 10-day celebration of winter, uh, extends from late January to early February, and, and we wanted to embrace the cold, which obviously is a core part of our northern identity. It's part of what makes us not just where we are, but I think who we are. And the, the thesis behind this was you know, we brought together a group of founding partners, and they all believed in this idea that if we joined forces, we could create something where the sum was greater than the parts and, and to form really a, a critical mass during this 10-day period. So our three founding partners are the U.S. Pond Hockey Championship, shown here on Lake Nokomis, the City of Lakes Lopin, which is a cross-country ski and dog sled and fat bike uh, celebration and series of races through, throughout Minneapolis, and then last but certainly not least, the St. Paul Winter Carnival, which is kind of the granddaddy of them all, 130 plus years of tradition in St. Paul celebrating winter. And so on this, on this foundation, on this platform of these three founding organizations coming together on, and, and aligning their calendars onto this 10-day period, we then started to build on that foundation with new programming. So this is an example of one of our, of our uh, new original events. This is our first year of the Great Northern. And so this is the street uh, between the Bachelor Farmer and then across the street are our friends uh, at the restaurant Spoon and Stable. And so we joined forces with, with those guys. and decided we wanted to put on an outdoor winter dinner. And this was on uh, January 31st. We, we went to the city and asked for permission to close the street to host an outdoor winter dinner in January. And they looked at us kind of funny when we went to ask for a permit to do this. And they kind of like looked at their records and they said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna give you the permit, but just so you know, no one has ever asked for permission to do this in city history, which to us was very exciting. I kind of knew we were onto something then. Um, and it was an experiment. We didn't know if people, it's kind of like the hats, it was like, all right, all right is anyone going to actually like, show up for this? And it sold out. We sold 100 tickets. You can see that it was one long table. And everyone got a custom Fairwell woolen mill blanket at their seat. We had fire pits. And it was an incredible experience. And beyond just the 100 people who got to be there for the dinner, uh, the, the, the event, the meal was covered by GQ magazine, departures, food and wine. And so the story of the event was told then to you know, millions of people through, through the stories, through the pictures that were shared. And so it, you know, it's an example of how we kind of share this positive winter story to start to replace that, that negative impression that my classmates had had in college. So if you haven't been to the Great Northern, I'm going to give you a little sense of what you've been missing out on, and hopefully you'll join us next winter. sharing the north, also from the Great Northern. Um, and that's a, 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 a part of the programming from um, the Super Bowl year, which was our second year of doing the Great Northern. And because the Super Bowl was going on during the same 10 days, we, know, we knew we needed to do something to, to cut through the, you know, that, that noise. There was a lot going on. And we always wanted to make sure that our was an important part of the Great Northern, because to me, it's a really important part of what we have to offer as a community. It's one of our real strengths, and so we want to make sure that that was something that we really held up during these 10 days. And so uh, in our second year, we commissioned the world's leading snow artist, which turns out, yes, is a, a job description. Um, and so this is Simon Beck, and he's, he's the world's leading snow artist, and he's from England. He flew in for a week to do this, uh, this project with us. It was underwritten by Red Bull, and then the twins made it possible by giving us the keys to Target Field for a week, which was pretty amazing. And uh, so I want to show you what Simon, what Simon created.
So that project was, was aired by ABC News across all of their national affiliates during the Super Bowl on the nightly news. And so if you add that to the media impressions of, of magazine articles over the last three years, the Great Northern has generated almost a billion media impressions, positive winter media impressions of, of Minnesota in the wintertime, which I think is really exciting because I think it really has the opportunity to change the perception of, of winter and therefore of our state across the country and, and even around the world. Um, so I want to now shift to the other poll chart that I, I said I was going to highlight, which is, uh, which is protect the north. And it's probably the one that, for me, has become most motivating, and, and I think for a lot of our team as well. And you know, I would, I would just point out that a lot of the great winter traditions that we just saw on the screen that I think are a huge part of our identity, those traditions are at risk, and our winters are at risk. And I was brought up to believe that in business, you don't have to choose between doing well and doing good that you can do both, and in fact, that those two ideas go hand in hand. And I learned that from my grandfather. He embedded that belief into the DNA of Target, and I'm doing what I can to embed it into the, the, the DNA of our, of our company. Um, so as the North has become a movement, our company's clearly benefited. We, we've grown with this idea, and, and as, I, as I said earlier, I want to make sure that that movement becomes a movement for good, and so we've, we've been trying that into our pole stars. Um, and the way that we do that is we're using the North as a platform to combat climate change with a mission that we call Keep the North Coal. And our goal is to help make Minnesota a leader in solving global climate change. And I view that as a really exciting opportunity for our community and for our state. Um, so I'll share a little bit more about what this looks like. So just, just for context, Minneapolis is projected to be the second most impacted city in the country by climate change. Uh, we're behind only New Orleans, and we've already started to see the devastating impacts of climate change on that city. So this is this is this is coming for us. This is gonna, this is already happening to us, uh, and we have the fastest warming winters of any state in the country. This is the facts. Um, so if we value winter, which I do, and I think some of you do, I hope all of you do, then we have to protect it. And so to do this at Asco Finison, what we've done is we've built climate accountability into our business model. And I'll just show you how that, what that looks like, how that works at our company. Welcome to the North, where we embrace our winners, not endure them. Sure, this place can be hard. It requires optimism, hard work, and perseverance. Together, we face down challenges. Creativity is born from constraint. We founded Asco Finlayson because we love exploring the outdoors in all four seasons, especially winter. But what's the north without the cold? Climate change threatens our winters, and with them, our best traditions. To celebrate the North, we must protect it. So we're making a big bet. To combat climate change, we're going to give 110%, literally. We'll measure the climate cost of our business and then give away more, 110% every year. To support innovation, to keep the North cold, relentless pursuit of solutions to the climate crisis. This is our biggest adventure yet. Join us. So I'll just I'll come back to our poll stars here to conclude. You know, I, I said at the beginning that our company, when we were founded, was rooted in a sense of place and a sense of pride in this place, and that's still very much true. But what we've done since then is, is turn that into a sense of purpose and, and a clear mission that, that guides all of us at the company. And you know, I would just say mission-driven leadership is something that I believe in, but it's not just motivating for me as the, as the leader of the company. I believe it motivates, and I've seen that it motivates our entire team, and it also helps attract great people that we need to come and join us and to, to want to work with us. And I really believe that people have a, have a desire to feel like they're a part of something bigger, uh, and bigger than themselves, and that I mean, whatever they're doing in their work, that they're contributing to something meaningful, something that they believe is important. And that's not just my opinion, it was actually proven in a, in a study that the, the uh, company LinkedIn did a workplace culture last year, 
and I thought this was pretty amazing, it said that almost 9 out of 10, so 86% of the millennial generation, so that's 22 to 38, um, would consider taking a pay cut to work at a company whose mission and values align with their own. And I think that's a, a pretty significant generational shift. If you compare that to the baby boomer, uh, baby boomer generation, so that's ages 54 to 72, only 9% would, would, would say the same thing or would have said the same thing uh, in their own careers. And so this is, this is a, big, a big movement where I think mission-driven, values-driven organizations uh, we certainly strive to be one. And um, I'll just share, here's a, here's a picture of our team. We're over 100 people now and growing. And these are you know, 100 plus people who are motivated not just by their love of this place, but also a desire to leave it better than they found it. And uh, to all of you, but especially to the students here today, I would hope that when, you're, when you graduate from here, you're able to go out and find a company to join whose, whose mission and values resonate with you, or, or perhaps for some of you, you go out and you'll start your own. So uh, with that, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.